Washington Journal continues. We're joined now by Virginia Republican Congressman Bob Goodlatte, the author of several different versions of the balanced budget amendment uh, that we want to talk about. But first, I want to get your, your thoughts, Congressman, on the question we asked the viewers at the top of the segment. Do you think that cameras should be allowed in the Supreme Court for the health care arguments that, have been, that are coming up? I think it would be a great experiment. Uh, I have uh, generally favored having cameras in courtrooms. Uh, we have them in a number of courtrooms around the country at the state level, and uh, I think that uh, uh, it's time that uh, folks got to see what happened in our courtrooms. I think it would build confidence in our judicial system for people to actually see and hear the oral arguments. Well, let's get into the balanced budget amendment that's coming up a little bit sooner than the uh, health care arguments. Uh, like I said, there, you, you're the author of several different versions. Explain the version. Two. Two. To be, not, not too many. But <laughs> there are 18 versions that have been introduced uh, in this Congress. Well, explain the version that, that is coming up for vote on Friday. Yes. Well, this is H.J. Res 2. It has 243 bipartisan co-sponsors, and uh, it was introduced on the first day of this Congress. It is identical with a couple of uh, small changes to the version that passed the House of Representatives in 1995 with 300 votes and failed in the Senate by one vote. And so we're having an opportunity to bring that up again. We're working again in a very bipartisan way to try to secure those uh, 290 votes. Uh, it is uh, definitely uh, you know, a steep hill to climb to get uh, two-thirds of the members of the House. How close do you, do you think you are? To, we're, to, we're close, to but we're not there yet. You're going to need uh, the, the current makeup of the House is 242 Republicans, 193 Democrats. You're going to need 48 Democrats to, to join you on this bill. Uh, 48, uh, and if we lose one or two Republicans, then we need 50. Well, th that's the question. I mean, are, do you have any Republicans that you think are, are not going to vote for this bill? As I understand it, H.J. Res. 1, the first version of this bill, is a, is a little bit stricter and was supported by uh, some members of, uh, of the Republican conference. Yes, well... H.J. Uh, Res. 1 has 133 co-sponsors, so there are 110 House Republicans who have not co-sponsored H.J. Res. 1. I also introduced that. Uh, it's my preferred bill because it requires a supermajority to balance the budget by raising taxes, and it requires uh, a spending cap uh, of 18 percent of GDP. That uh, uh, amendment just does not get uh, bipartisan support. There's one Democratic co-sponsor of it. And uh, therefore, uh, the Republican leadership uh, consulted in a, in a rather unique way the conference, uh, both in terms of holding a special conference to hear from members which amendment they wanted to bring up and uh, in terms of surveying the members to see which one they preferred. And overwhelmingly, uh, the Republican conference uh, uh, indicated that they wanted H.J. Res. 2 primarily because of two things. One, uh, that it had a chance of passage and two, that it showed the kind of bipartisanship that you need to pass any constitutional amendment. With a two-thirds majority or 290 votes needed, uh, it's not something that any one party can pass. So we're in the process of trying to build that consensus. There are members who would prefer uh, you know, tougher provisions uh, on the conservative side. There are members uh, who would prefer uh, more moderate or even liberal pr provisions uh, on, the, on the liberal side. This attempts to strike the balance in the middle and has the greatest chance of getting those 290 votes. Well, let's talk about what's actually in H.J. Res. 2, the one that's, uh, that's coming up on the House floor. Uh, there is no deficit spending without a three-fifths majority in Congress, uh, three-fifths congressional majority needed to raise the debt limit. The president must submit a balanced budget to Congress annually, and it prohibits any bill to increase revenue from becoming law unless approved by the majority of Congress. Yeah, and that's an absolute majority as opposed to current law, which says it's a majority of those members present and voting. For those who are concerned about uh, tax increases, and certainly uh, I'm one of them, this does tighten up that provision a little bit, but it doesn't have the two-thirds majority required by H.J. Res. 1 to raise taxes. That's, that would, simply, that's the, the, the tougher that's bill. The, uh, the so-called tougher version that does not get uh, anywhere near the 290 votes that are needed to pass. Uh, what are some of the other tougher provisions in H.J. So the other, one, the, the other one. key one is a, is a spending cap of 18 percent of GDP. In other words, the federal government would not be able to spend more than 18 percent of GDP. And there was some discussion about whether that would be 18 percent or 20 percent, but at the end of the day, neither one of those figures, again, uh, drew the kind of support necessary for passage. So when this for, came up for a discussion between your colleagues, 
which one did you speak for? You're the, the author of both. You introduced both. Well, I told my colleagues that I thought that uh, the best approach was to take the amendment that had the greatest chance of passage and was still a strong amendment. And because it does have that supermajority to raise, uh, to not balance the budget, supermajority to raise the debt limit, and the absolute majority to raise taxes. This is a good, strong amendment. It's proven because it's passed the House before, come close in the Senate, and the members uh, overwhelmingly agree that they wanted to, to try to do something rather than simply uh, make a statement about the amendment that they preferred the most knowing that that amendment has no chance of passage now and unlikely will ever have a chance of passage simply because it doesn't draw the kind of bipartisan support that's necessary for a constitutional amendment. Again, we're talking with Virginia Republican Bob Goodlad. If you want to call in, ask a question about the balanced budget amendment, give us a ring on the uh, Democratic line. It's 202-737-0001. The numbers are there on your screen. Republican line, 202-737-0002. Uh, the independent line, 202-628-0205, and if you're outside the United States, 202-628-0184. Uh, yesterday, Congressman, the White House issued their official statement of administrative policy on H.J. Res 2, the one that's coming up on the floor for a vote. Uh, I want to read you some of that. Uh, the administration strongly opposes H.J. Res 2. We do not need to amend the Constitution for only the 28th time in our nation's history to do the job of restoring financial fiscal discipline. Instead, it requires us, as members of both parties have done in the past, to move beyond politics as usual and find bipartisan common ground to restore us to a sustainable fiscal path. Under H.J. Res 2, a minority in a single House of Congress could block and, uh, the will of the majority and the executive to waive its provisions when our country faces a downturn. If H.J. Res 2 had been in effect in recent years, such a minority in one House would have been able to prevent efforts to override the requirements for tax increases or spending cuts risking an even deeper contraction and pushing the economy into a second Great Depression. I wanted to get your thoughts on the administration's response. Well, uh, this is not news. Uh, the president said back uh, in the summer when there was discussion about the debt limit and the crisis that actually led to the House of Representatives voting and the Senate voting overwhelmingly to require these votes on the Constitution, which are now going to take place here before December 31. This week in the House, sometime uh, a little later in the Senate, the President A different said, version in the Senate. Well, whatever they choose, unless the House passes uh, a particular version. If the House passes the version we're voting on on Friday, then the Senate has to You'll vote send that. on the identical version. That's part of the law. That's part of the requirement. Mm -hmm. But here's the point. Uh, the President overlooks the fact that over the last 50 years, the Congress has only balanced its budget six times in 50 years. It's resulted in a $15 trillion uh, national debt. And uh, in times of crisis, uh, uh, the nation has rallied to do the right thing. But the problem is that we've had too many years of bipartisan support for not balancing the budget and simply borrowing money and kicking the can down the road to future generations. And presidents of both parties and congresses of both parties have been at fault uh, in not having the discipline to make these tough decisions. This is not a new idea. It's not my idea. Thomas Jefferson uh, first raised this just nine years after our Constitution went into effect in 1798 when he said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said he wished for a single amendment to the Constitution, and by that he meant a single article uh, upon which he would be willing to rely for a reduction of the government, and by that he meant a prohibition on borrowing. Now, this amendment does not go quite that far because uh, we have exceptions to address the concerns that the president raised in his uh, in his point and, and in fact Thomas Jefferson later borrowed money to, for the purpose of the Louisiana purchase but if you have a big idea or a big need uh, the Congress uh, should recognize that and act but in all other years the Congress should be balancing the budget and they're simply not doing it it's too easy to not make the tough decisions and kick the can down the road to our children and grandchildren. Let's go to the phones. First, we have Marie on the Democratic line from Albert Lee, Minnesota. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Yes, I just want to make a comment uh, to this gentleman. Uh, we will never be able to control the budget until we get the health care costs down. And the only way you can do that is go after the insurance companies and also your hospital administration. And there's no way that these people that are charging these prices for these uh, operations 
I had my boyfriend passed away. His was a hundred six thousand for a, for an aneurysm. I'm sorry, sir, but it's just got to come down. That's where we have to start controlling it. You can sit there and put everything on Barack Obama, but until you get the cost down for medical at the hospital administration level and uh, also your insurance companies, it's just a revolving door. We're always going to have this problem. Congressman? Well, uh, you're absolutely right. The fact of the matter is we do have a circumstance in which uh, health care costs are growing at a very rapid rate. Uh, Medicare, for example, is growing at four times the rate of inflation. When it was adopted in 1965, uh, it was projected that by 1990 it would cost $12 billion a year. In 1990, it actually cost $110 billion a year. Last year, it cost $524 billion. By 2020, it's projected to approach a trillion dollars. That trajectory simply cannot be sustained. Uh, it's one more reason why we need a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution because over all these years with that fast trajectory, no one has been willing to step in and offer the kind of changes that are needed to slow the rate of uh, increase in the cost of uh, programs like Medicare. It's an important program, but it cannot be sustained unless uh, the costs are controlled. Congress needs to take that up. We proposed in our budget this year, and the House passed it, uh, reforms of Medicare. Uh, the uh, White House has not put on the table a specific alternative to control that. The, the White House's plan, which is now law for health care for other people, uh, doesn't have sufficient controls in it. So these are, these are differences of opinion uh, that uh, have to be hammered out. But instead of simply saying, well, we'll figure out a, a way to patch this up and continue it year after year, meaning borrowing more and more money, where this year we're borrowing $1.3 trillion, we have got to force the Congress and presidents uh, to find budgets that live within the means of government. And this is a perfect example of how that's not happening and why we're in the deep hole that we're in now and why uh, one of the bond rating agencies downgraded U.S. Treasuries. Uh, well, there's a lot of hand-wringing right now over the current uh, super committee debates and whether the trigger sure. is going ki to kick in and make automatic cuts to military and domestic spending. A question here from Twitter. But it doesn't... It doesn't uh, do very much at all to touch uh, any of the entitlement programs which comprise 65 percent of the federal budget. Uh, it's all focused on discretionary spending uh, both on the defense side and on the domestic side. And quite frankly everything uh, in uh, federal government spending has to be on the table but the uh, fact of the matter is it uh, isn't right now. And well, a question from Twitter is if you get a balanced budget amendment will you cut the military budget? Oh, I think everything has to be on the table. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, many in the military who've argued that we can have a stronger national defense uh, if we have a leaner and meaner, if you will, uh, defense structure. Secretary Gates, while he was secretary, uh, made the point that there are some privates in the Army that have a hundred levels to go through in the chain of command to reach him uh, if they were trying to have a decision made. That's, that's an enormous bureaucracy. And I think it indicates, as do a number of other problems with our military, that there is definitely room uh, for savings in defense spending, and it should be on the table. Back to the phones with Congressman uh, Bob Goodlett, Republican from Virginia, in the Roanoke, Harrisonburg, Lynchburg area. Uh, Keith is on the Republican line from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Hi, first time caller. Um, your previous guest uh, on the House and Ways Com Committee mentioned that we can remove a person after two years of an election cycle. He said this is a democracy. Um, and that kind of made me think about this. We really are a republic in the United States. And this super committee is a split six to six. Have it, you know, I'm just a little confused to how this can happen. Um, and just run with that thought about a republic versus democracy, and we're going to be relying on a, a democracy, democracy running this uh, super committee. And Keith, while we have you, would you be in support of a balanced budget amendment? I think we lost Keith, Keith there. Well, I, I th first of all, uh, he's right. We have what's called a representative democracy or a republic where people elect representatives to make decisions for them. Uh, this is an unusual process. Uh, it's not one that I think uh, should be uh, tried over and over again, but uh, the uh, confrontation that took place over the summer about how to achieve deficit reduction uh, didn't go anywhere near far enough. And they couldn't agree on, even if they could agree on how much they were going to cut, they couldn't agree 
on uh, what they were going to cut, so they put in a provision to have this panel of uh, 12 members, uh, six Republicans, three from the House, three from the Senate, six Democrats, three from the House, three from the Senate, any seven of which, uh, if they reach consensus of, of a majority of them, can then send something to the full House and the full Senate for a straight up or down vote. Uh, I hope they succeed in coming up with uh, spending reductions. Uh, if they don't, uh, sequestration will take place, which will provide for $1.2 trillion in cuts. That's added to $900 billion in cuts that were agreed upon uh, back in July. And that's still less than 25% of what we would need to do to balance the budget over the next 10 years. I voted for uh, the House budget, which made a further step in the right direction. Uh, it cut nearly $6 trillion uh, over uh, 10 years. And it doesn't balance for 28 years. And then I voted for the Republican Study Committee budget, which balances in nine years, which is within the budget window. And that's the toughest one that was offered uh, in the Congress this year. I always vote for that toughest budget. It never gets the votes necessary to pass. I think we got about 120 votes this year, half of what's needed, uh, or 100 votes short of what's needed to pass in the House. And I think the discipline that's necessary here is for members of Congress who are elected by the people and who uh, and of whom 80 percent of the public supports a balanced budget amendment in poll after poll uh, to go home and explain why they didn't balance the budget if they were required to do so in the United States Constitution. I think that is a very powerful discipline that's lacking in our Constitution and a great many people agree with me including a great many Democrats. Uh, the poll I just cited showed that 74 percent of Democrats uh, in that poll supported a balanced budget constitutional amendment. Let's go to Tom, an independent from McDonald uh, County, Missouri. Good morning. Good morning, Representative. Uh, thanks for taking my call. I, uh, uh, I think I have a uh, suggestion that uh, uh, would help immensely clean up every department in the federal government. Waste, fraud, and abuse is, is rampant, and the duplicity. Uh, just just clean up these departments, and, and that would save untold billions, billions. Let me give you a real quick example. In 2003, we were going to get a, a I'll just call it a rebate check. Months and months before it ever happened, every news media, newspaper, television, radio, everything informed the American public we were going to get a check. About two weeks before the checks were to be cut, we get a letter from the federal government, which costs millions of dollars to send out those letters, telling us we were going to get a check, and every citizen already knew it. We got the check. After the check, about two weeks, we received another letter telling us, well, now you should have received your check, and so ta 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 And that cost millions and millions of dollars for duplicity. Please clean up, you know, Social Security the waste, fraud, and abuse, Medicare, clean, clean up the, your own houses. Tom, in, in the meantime, while they're, and, while they're working on cleaning that up, do you, do you think a balanced budget amendment is needed? Absolutely. We need a balanced budget amendment to keep things in proper order. Thank you, sir, for taking my call. Thanks, Tom. Let's go to uh, Angela, Democrat. If I might chime sure. in, I think, I think Tom makes a very good point. Uh, the fact of the matter is there is tremendous waste, I think, in virtually every government agency because the discipline is not there uh, for, and it begins with the Congress and the President. The President's required to submit a budget to the Congress. The Congress is supposed to pass a budget. Uh, some years they don't even pass a budget. For many years they haven't passed one that balances, uh, even balances inside the budget window, which is a 10-year period of time. And so that ethic gets passed down to the bureaucracy. And instead of uh, the Congress saying, this is all we have because we've got to balance the budget, and then conducting oversight to make sure that what they want each of these agencies to accomplish or uh, make the decision that some of the agencies may not be needed and can be eliminated, uh, either way, the discipline is not there in the Congress to make the tough decision because they're not required to balance the budget. Let's get back to Angela, a Democrat from uh, Maryland. Good morning. Hi. Um, yes, my comment was I believe uh, this balanced budget amendment would be sort of a backdoor way, I believe, to cut entitlements, which obviously you agree is the big spending along with defense. 
I think what would happen now that the baby boomers are coming into Medicare and Social Security, what would happen if we had an amendment to the Constitution, it would just be easy for Congress to say, well, we'd like to increase your Social Security or we're going to have to cut Medicare even though you promise people 55 or older, you won't. You're just going to say, well, that's what we wanted to do, but, you know, we can't, we're going to have to do it. It's in the Constitution. Uh, all these baby boomers are having a lot of hospital bills. We're just, sorry, our hands are tied. It's in the Constitution. I just see this as a, a just a backdoor way to cut entitlements for people. Well, the irony would be that uh, if we continue down the path, we're going three years in a row now with uh, more than a trillion dollar uh, deficit, uh, totaling uh, a $15 trillion national debt accumulated over uh, many years. Uh, the irony would be that uh, as we hand this huge debt on to the next generation and the one after that, that they would have the debt burdening them, causing them to have a lower standard of living, and they would not have the benefit of these programs because we simply could not afford them. The proposals we've made don't uh, even cut spending uh, in the major, you know, like Medicare. We don't cut Medicare. We simply slow the rate of increase in spending so it doesn't increase at four times the rate of inflation. Uh, the first year Medicare was in effect, there were 18.5 million senior citizens and it cost $1.2 billion. Last year, there were 45 million senior citizens, about two and a third times as many. We spent $524 billion, uh, nearly 500 times as much money. So and that kind of uh, inflationary effect over years is destroying the program. It isn't uh, reform of the program that will destroy it. It will be if we don't exercise the discipline to reform these programs and make them work uh, more effectively. There's questions out there, too, about what happens with the balanced budget amendment in a national emergency. Freelancer on Twitter asks, if we have a national emergency with the GOP's bill, we will not have money needed to care for people. GOP's balanced budget amendment bill is suicide. Well, it's not a GOP bill. Uh, it is a bipartisan bill. It has support of uh, dozens of Democrats. We'll find out on Friday whether we have enough uh, to pass it. But uh, here's the point. There are lots of different ways uh, to balance the budget. And there are also provisions in this balanced budget amendment that are safeguards against the circumstances that the uh, uh, the, the, your, your Twitter uh, the tweet, con, the tweet uh, calls for, and that is this. Uh, there are three ways you don't balance the budget in particular years. If there's a declaration of war, which is very rare, it hasn't happened in 70 years in the United States. If there's a military conflict, uh, because we don't want to tie the hands of any commander-in-chief from having to uh, to take action, uh, the Congress can affirmatively vote by just a majority vote to not balance the budget, but only to the extent of the cost of the conflict. And then the overarching uh, safeguard, if there's a national emergency of some kind, uh, the Congress can vote uh, by a 60 percent uh, majority to not balance the budget. That's the safeguard against Congress is just every year saying, well, we're not going to balance the budget this year. There's got to be something that makes it a steeper hill to climb. And uh, that's what that provision does. But uh, I would point out that even during the uh, the debt limit crisis over the summer, the final vote on that was very close to, if not, 60 percent of the members of the House and Senate voting for it. So uh, I think that even in the uh, very contentious times the Congress finds itself in right now, when there is a real need, when there is a real emergency, members will do the right thing. And... Uh, in the meantime, when there's not an emergency, when the economy's growing and revenues are growing, uh, we should be using that to balance the budget and pay down this $15 trillion debt and not transfer that uh, to our children and grandchildren. That's, that's the whole point of this debate. Let's go to Frank, a Republican from Westchester, Westchester, Pennsylvania. Yeah, hi. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, the common theme I keep hearing discussed is kicking the can down the road, and I think that is absolutely correct um, I'd like the congressman to uh, discuss how health care costs are going to be addressed should Obamacare be thrown out well uh, health care uh, does need to be reformed because we're facing uh, rising costs and uh, uh, there are a lot of people who do not uh, have uh, the ability to afford health insurance or do not have it provided to them by their employer and they're above the poverty line and therefore they don't qualify for Medicaid or for low-income people. Um, 
there are a number of reforms to health care that we should put into effect, one of which is that we should be um, having medical liability reform to cut down on defensive medicine and uh, uh, the extraordinary extraordinary cost of liability insurance that doctors and hospitals and other health care providers face. Another is we should allow uh, people to purchase insurance across state lines so we have more insurance companies competing with each other. In the uh, House budget that we passed this year are provisions for reforming Medicare and Medicaid uh, to slow the rate of growth of those programs to the rate of inflation instead of several times the rate of inflation which we're facing now. Uh, and if we would do all of these things uh, and move away from a new entitlement program uh, 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 under the President's health care plan that become law and being challenged in court and the House has voted to overturn it, the Senate narrowly voted not to overturn it. Um, if we were to overturn that, that also would, in my opinion, be a much sounder uh, fiscal way to address these problems. But there are programs uh, like uh, community health centers and uh, free clinics and other things that meet the need of people who don't have health insurance. There are other things that we could do without having a massive new program that I think, like Medicare, will wind up costing far, far more than the projections indicated when it was voted on two years ago. On the independent line from Merrillville, Indiana, David, you're on with Congressman Bob Goodlot. Yeah, um, my question is actually um, with the Super Committee in session right now, and they are like, what, well, what my answer is, is that what's going to happen if uh, Congress does nothing has has no proposal about the uh, cuts that they're going to make, and who is going to be in charge of making those cuts at, after the triggers take place? Do you want to well, run through that, Congressman? Uh, well, of course, he's referring to the the uh, legislation that was passed, sets up the super committee. They're meeting now. They have until next Wednesday to come up with an agreement to cut uh, at least one point two trillion dollars. They can go higher than that. Uh, and if they fail to do that, there are $1.2 trillion in cuts that are built into the legislation already. Um, some of it comes from entitlement programs, but very little. Most of it comes from domestic discretionary spending, about half, uh, and uh, defense and homeland security spending, roughly the other half. And, so and there's also some thought right now as to maybe go back and look at that trigger and see if some of that legislation needs to be rethought. And there's a lot of articles out there right now. This is from today's Washington Post. Super Committee could add uncertainty to the holiday shopping. Businesses are getting nervous about Washington again with the Super Committee cuts. Um, your thoughts on going back and looking at that trigger? Well, uh, first of all, uh, I believe we need at least that much in terms of, of cuts. So I would have to see what alternative were adopted. We're looking to see if the super committee can agree to something. If they can't, then there's nothing to stop the House and the Senate from passing something different. But it would also have to be signed by uh, the president, and the president has already threatened uh, to veto measures that uh, moved away from uh, what was already agreed upon. So again, I would hope that he would keep an open mind about anything particular the Congress did, and we all should look at seeing whether there's a better way to put cuts through. But I think, in my, you know, from my standpoint, they have to be at least as great as the cuts that are are there now, because we're borrowing. Uh, this is 1.2 trillion dollars over 10 years, and we're borrowing 1.3 trillion dollars per year right now. That may go down a little bit over the next few years, but we're really on target to borrow a trillion dollars a year as far as the eye can see. So this is really a down payment on what needs to be done. It's not enough. We've got about 10 minutes left with Congressman Bob Goodlot. I uh, want to talk about bring it back to the uh, balanced budget amendment and to the, the timing of, of this amendment. There's a question on Twitter. Uh, if a balanced budget amendment were passed and ratified, when would it actually go into effect? So can you take us through Sort of, we've got the vote Friday, but where do we go from here? Okay, well, if we got 290 votes on Friday, let's assume, uh, then that would go over to the United States Senate, and under the agreement uh, that was signed into law uh, over the summer, the Senate would have to vote on the identical version. If they got 67 votes, and there's question about whether they would in this, and they, remember, this hasn't been voted on in 15 years. It's been an issue, been around for a long time, but parties. You were in Congress last time I got a vote, absolutely. correct? Absolutely. And then, you know, Republicans have been in control of the Congress and Democrats have been in control of the Congress and neither party brought it up for a vote until uh, this new Congress with a lot of outside interest and with a lot of 
um, uh, push from the public and the heightened debt uh, crisis and attention focused on it finally brought it back to the fore again. So it passes the Senate. Uh, it would then go not to the president, who has no uh, say in constitutional amendment. He can offer his opinion, as he's done, but he, he doesn't get to sign a bill or anything like that. It goes directly to the state legislatures, where three-quarters of them, or 38 of them, have to ratify it. Now, 49 out of 50 states have to live with a balanced budget requirement themselves, most of them right. in, in their constitution. So the thinking is that with 80% public support and legislators who already live by this, the states would ratify it. They have, under this constitutional amendment, seven years to do so. If we send it to the states, to me, that would be uh, the starting point for for members to say, okay, uh, we, we better start moving in a very concerted direction toward bringing this to a balanced budget. The amendment allows five years after ratification to complete that process and bring it into balance. And the, uh, so we're talking about possibly 12 years down the road? It could be 12 years, but it could be less than 12 years if the states ratified it more quickly. Let's go back to the phones on uh, the Democratic line is Linda from Kansas City, Missouri. You there, Linda? Hello. Yeah, go ahead. You're on with Congressman Bob Goodlatte. I am. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't even uh, got my the questions asked if I was a demo where I was calling from. Oh, go for it. What's your question for the congressman? <clears throat> okay. Well, um, I what I wanted to uh, address is uh, the uh, Jude Lewinsky policy of uh, two Santa Claus theory, and how that's uh, really the true irony. Uh, the Do you policy, have a question about the balanced budget amendment? I'm sorry, yes, this pertains to the balanced budget okay. am amendment. Yeah, the policy of Jude Lewinsky was to spend like drunken sailors uh, and then uh, complain about the deficit down the road when there wasn't a Republican in the White House. And that's exactly what's taking place now. The deficit is in the problem. The, the real issue is where the money is. And if you want to amend the Constitution, and I don't think this is the solution, but take out the wordage where corporation and personhood is com combined. Because at this point, because of, your, of the policies we've been following for the last 30 years, 147 multinational corporations own the world. We have to get the money out. We must have publicly financed campaigns because any congressperson who truly wants this government to work instead of pointing to government and saying this is the problem, realizing, realizes that dialing for dollars is not the way. Is a Your balanced country, budget amendment a step in the right direction, you think, Linda? I'm sorry? Is a balanced budget amendment a step in the right direction? No. What we need now is R&D money to create businesses. Uh, Steve Jobs from Apple would still would never have left his garage if it weren't for decades of research and development money that went into that industry. What we need now is to stimulate our economy, to start creating jobs for the middle class. I mean, your party always says that 40% of our taxes are being paid by the 1%. Well, the 1% are earning 100 times the amount of the working person. Well, let's so give they... the congressman a chance to respond. Well, actually, that's not correct. Uh, they do earn more. Obviously, the very wealthiest uh, people pay 38% of the personal income taxes. They have about 20%. Uh, of the income, uh, they should pay more, both in terms of uh, absolute dollars and in terms of percentage. Uh, and uh, we can certainly debate what the appropriate share is for each uh, part of our uh, economy. But the fact of the matter is, both parties have ignored this responsibility to not borrow money uh, from our children and grandchildren to pay for things that we're, we're spending and using up today. And that's the real issue behind a balanced budget amendment and why I think it's so important. Every year I vote for the toughest budget offered in the Congress, ones that lead to balance. And uh, it's unfortunate that those never pass. Uh, we can continue down that path, and if this balanced budget amendment fails, I suspect that's the path uh, that the majority in the Congress will continue down. But we're headed towards a precipice that is not unlike what is going on in Europe right now. And so this would be a great way to turn the corner and move in a different direction. And we hope the super committee succeeds. We hope that there is other discipline for reducing the deficit. But uh, most people in the country think that this discipline ought to be put in our Constitution. Let's go to Steve, a Republican from Scottsdale, Arizona. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, 
you know, I just wanted to say, uh, yeah, I wish we were more creative in uh, trying to de deal with this. Um, I like how some of the other callers mentioned, you know, like thinking outside the box that, you know, we need to have uh, not just Republicans and Democrats in there, but, you know, independents. We need there's like really creative ways that we can get more money in people's pockets, you know, like um, and make the economy better. Like we could, uh, you know, do away with the HOV lane. Or, you know, you're not supposed to use it during rush hour. You know, that would make it easier for people to get to a, where they got to go and spend money. You know, little things like that, or take out the MTBE out of the gas, making the um, <clears throat> makes the gas cheaper. Um, little fixes like that would put more money in people's pockets. Then you could raise the taxes a little bit, and you could do some cuts, but it but also trade off a little bit and get more money in people's pockets and get things going better. I think I think we got to be really really creative now because we're coming it sounds like we're coming down to where it's really going to be critical. We're going to have to maybe, you know, hurt the environment a little bit in order to keep us from having a bankruptcy environment, which I think is a lot worse than a little bit of more pollution in the air. Congressman? Well, uh, government regulations are, I think, a, a significant problem. And the House has passed, uh, with some very strong bipartisan votes, uh, a number of regulatory reform measures that we've sent over to the Senate here in the last uh, several weeks. And, we and have, some still coming up, correct? Is we, there, oh, the yeah. RAINS Act the, coming up? We have uh, more coming up this week, and we have more coming up in December, and we have more uh, coming up uh, in uh, the next year as well. Again, we've got to... Uh, find bipartisan support to do it because you've got to have that support to get it through the United States Senate. We found that bipartisan support in the House. Some of these bills have had 40 or 50 or more Democrats uh, joining with Republicans to pass them. Uh, the balanced budget amendment uh, is not a panacea. It, it, in my opinion, what it will do, it will, will focus the mind and it will cause members of Congress uh, and presidents to be more creative in finding ways to save money uh, to uh, uh, grow the economy uh, by having government operate more efficiently and not piling up this huge debt which is calling into question the worthiness of our treasury bills and whether investment in this country is a sound idea anymore. We talk about partnering with Democrats. Last time this came up in 1995 when the House approved a balanced budget amendment. Uh, now Minority Whip Steny Hoyer was with you. Uh, yesterday uh, he talked about why he's against the balanced budget amendment this time around. Uh, this is from the Hill. Hoyer explains flip on balanced budget amendment as showing consistency. He says, unfortunately, I did not contemplate the irresponsibility that I have seen fiscally over the last nine years or eight years of the Bush administration and Republican leadership of the House and the Senate and this last few months where Republicans took America to the brink of default. Hoyer pointed out that the Clinton administration was able to generate budget surpluses without a balanced budget amendment in place, surpluses that quickly turned deficit under the Bush administration. I have over the last 16 years had a substantial erosion in my confidence in the willingness of the other party to get uh, to get to balance, particularly paying for what they bought, Hoyer said. Well, he's been roundly criticized by members of his own party uh, for uh, making that change in his position and for making this a partisan issue because it's clearly not a partisan issue. Uh, in 1995, 72 Democrats voted for it. There will be dozens of Democrats voting for it again this time. And the fact of the matter is that uh, there's certainly disagreement on, on what an appropriate policy measure is. But uh, he's saying that he doesn't trust Republicans to do the right thing in a time of, of an emergency. And yet here he is making it a partisan issue. I think that's unfortunate. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, at some point in time in the future uh, we'll get his support back for a balanced budget amendment. But in the meantime, there are many members of his party uh, who think that we should go in a different direction and are working in a bipartisan way to uh, bring uh, about a balanced budget amendment. In a couple minutes we have left, let's get in Larry, an independent from Rockville, Maryland. Yes, good morning. Good morning. The, uh, the, uh, this idea of, uh, of uh, putting in an amendment for a balanced budget, if you want to talk about kicking the can down the road, that's the ultimate of kicking the can down the road. What you're doing is you're taking away your options to make tough decisions. You're handcuffing yourself. No one in business or no one in life takes away your options, and that's exactly what it's doing. It'll, it's just like three strikes you're out. There are many judges that would love to 
to uh, make another decision to send someone to jail or do some other type of punishment. But like three strikes, you're out, their hands are tied. You do not want to tie your hands. You can see this bailout, if it hadn't been for the money injected, as much as I dislike what happened on Wall Street, if we didn't bail out those firms, let me tell you, we'd be in a 1930s depression right now. And you want to talk about sit-ins and, and anarchy, that would be a major, major problem. Even President Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, a very sensible president, had the common sense to know we shouldn't be participating in uh, the war in, uh, in not the war, but in Laos and in Thailand uh, long before because he asked his guys how much is it going to cost. How much we're running out of time. I want to give the congressman a chance sure. to respond. Sure. Well, I think he has it just exactly backwards. Uh, local governments, state governments are all required to balance their budget each and every year. Families, businesses, they can't go very far without uh, bringing their uh, uh, income in line with their expenditures. The idea that somehow the federal government is exempt from this has thrived here in Washington for the last two generations, for 50 years. It's resulted in a $15 trillion national debt that is destroying the options that we have in this country. Uh, and the focus has got to be on living within your means, paying down that debt, and then uh, future generations will have a brighter future. This will force the Congresses to make the tough decisions uh, and not pass them on down to future generations. Last question for you. What's your prediction on the vote on Friday? Well, we're close, but we're not there yet, so I'm not going to make any predictions other than to say that I'm going to be spending all my time here uh, in the next 48 hours uh, to see if we can find uh, the necessary votes to pass it. Uh, if we succeed, we'll send it over to the Senate. If we don't succeed, we will use that as a building block to keep this issue at the front uh, of the burner and uh, the American electorate is with us. They've been with us the whole time. The Congress has neglected the issue for a long time. We shouldn't do that. We should continue to build support for it. Congressman, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Up next, we have a discussion on the Constitution as part of